science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council of Science and Technology. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council of Science and Technology. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council of Science and Technology. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council of Science and Technology. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council of Science and Technology. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council of Science and Technology. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council of Science and Technology. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council of Science and Technology. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. C to S T. To S T. C to and welcome to tonight's final program in our three-part series, Cancer Research, Pets to People. My name is Dawn Lepret, and I am the Assistant Director of Development and Programs at C2ST. Tonight's topic explores cancer research with human applications. Did you know that as of 2018, there are 471 million dogs, 471 million dogs, and 370 million cats, that's 370 million cats, kept as pets worldwide, according to Statista. Tonight's program is presented to you in partnership with the Carl R. Rose Institute for Genomic Biology and the Catherine and Don Kleinman Center for Genomics in Business and Society, and of course, the University of Illinois System. Now, the Chicago Council on Science and Technology's mission is to inspire and engage all segments of society about science and tech and their contributions. We are excited to be entering our 15th year of offering science and tech programs, such as the one tonight, to the public. Please visit C2ST2 dot cnf dot io to ask questions during the program or towards the end and you can also visit c2st.org to learn more about our upcoming programs and to donate and now we'd like to take the time to introduce you to our featured speaker who has been so gracious with his time and sharing his knowledge Dr. Timothy Fan has been a veterinarian doctor certified in internal medicine and medical oncology for over 20 years. Dr. Fan's training as a scientist and a veterinarian has given him a unique perspective and opportunity to investigate cancer in pets and translate the treatment to people. And that's what we're going to talk about this evening. Remember to go to c 2 st 2 cnf.io to ask any and all questions. 
And at this point, Dr. Fan, I hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Don. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining uh, tonight. This is uh, the third of a series of three. I'm, I'm really excited to have been uh, trying to provide some hopefully interesting information. Um, today, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about you know, how, how can we actually translate the findings that we've learned from pet dogs and cats with cancer. How can we leverage comparative oncology really to ultimately help people? And so it's really going to be about human applications um, for novel therapeutics that have been developed through the chemistry department here at the University of Illinois with the inclusion of pet dogs, pet cats that have accelerated those discoveries. So um, if we start, what we can see is that cancer is a deadly disease. I think that we, we all recognize that this is uh, something we've talked about, that it's the second leading cause of death for, for uh, people in the world. Um, and it's really the uncontrolled growth of mutated cells and importantly, um, the bad cancers or the aggressive cancers specifically have the ability to invade and spread throughout the body. And if we look at um, some of the most common cancers that are affecting both men and women, uh, breast cancer is the most common tumor in a woman. Prostate cancer is the most uh, common tumor in men. And we know that these tumors um, when they remain localized, they're very curable with uh, either radiation or surgery. Um, and so what we can see is that you know, melanoma, colon cancer, breast cancer, or even lung cancer, as long as they are localized, we, are, we actually have a good chance of controlling and uh, handling um, those, those type of tumors. Uh, where we begin to have problems is when these cancers spread and invade. And so when we look at the primary tumor, such as a, a lung tumor or breast tumor, we can treat these effectively by local treatments. But when these tumors actually get into the bloodstream and they begin to spread, and they can spread to distant sites, such as the, this is an example of the liver or the bone or the brain. And so it's the metastatic spread of cancers that are highly problematic, and 90% of cancer deaths are the result of metastatic disease. Um, very interestingly, where these tumors spread uh, in the, the metastatic site is highly prognostic. And what we can see here is that this is a, a diagram from women with breast cancer, and that when the primary breast cancer spreads to different sites, such as the liver or the lung or the lymph node or bone, the, this, these are the survival curves, meaning that how long do people live for when they have metastatic, metastasis to these different organs? And the real outlier here is going to be really the central nervous system or the brain. We can see that the brain, if you have brain metastasis, then this is a big problem for the survival of those, of those individuals. So if we, if we kind of think about brain cancer, um, what, we, what we have to understand is that you can have brain metastases as well as primary tumors uh, from the brain. And what we know is that in, in looking at common tumors in people, we see that lung cancer is the most common primary tumor that ultimately will spread to the brain. So about one in five people that have lung cancer will develop a lesion or metastasis within their brain. Uh, and there are other tumors that have uh, a predilection to spread to the brain. Melanoma is a big one. Renal cell carcinoma is another one. Breast cancer, ovarian cancer, colon cancer. So many of these very common big tumors uh, they become very problematic when they spread to different parts of the body, but in particular, the brain is a very, very bad place to spread to. If we think about primary tumors, meaning tumors that arise from the central nervous system, in, in this context, we'll talk about the brain, we have what we call non-malignant brain tumors and malignant brain tumors. And seven out of 10 brain tumors are categorized as non-malignant, and three out of 10 are considered malignant. And what I want to focus on are these malignant tumors. And what we can see is that the breakdown of these malignant tumors, over about half of them are this really, really aggressive tumor called glioblastoma multiforme. Another 11% and 18% are other forms of glial tumors that we'll talk about. So 
in collective, about 80% of malignant brain tumors are glial tumors. And I think that we probably learn most about glioblastoma really from high profile um, po political figures that have been stricken and taken away from society. Uh, so we know that Ted Kennedy had this tumor and died. We know John McCain died from this tumor. And we know Bo Biden died from this tumor too. And given the Biden administration and, and their personal connectivity with Bo in this terrible disease, um, President Bush has reinvigorated the Moonshot Initiative, which is to identify new therapies and hopefully reduce the incidence of cancer death by 50% within 25 years is the goal. So the one question is, you know, with these aggressive brain tumors, it's incredibly dismal survival. And we have to understand what are the cells that make up the brain tissues and are these the cells that are forming the cancers? And what we know is that when we look at brain tissue, certainly we have neurons that make up brain tissue, but 90% of the cells within our brain are not neurons. They are support cells, which are known as glial cells. And glial cells do many, many different functions that are necessary. One thing that glial cells do, we have uh, different forms. We have microglia. And in, in microglia, what we see here is uh, kind of a, um, an immune cell of the central nervous system. We have ependymal cells, which are lining cells that make the ventricles and they secrete cerebral spinal fluid. Um, we have oligodendrocytes, which are going to uh, make our nerves fire more quickly. And then we have astrocytes, which are the major support cells of our brain. And so what we can see here is that if we look at the makeup of the brain tissue, we have neurons. They're certainly very, very important. But we can see that we have microglia, we have oligodendrocytes, which are going to help make the electrical conductance across these neurons faster. We have astrocytes that are, are very important for supporting the blood work as well as supporting the neurons. And then we have these ependymal cells that are secretory cells. And so again, if we look at the malignant tumors from the brain, 80% of them are glioma because they're coming from the glial cells. And so they're glioma cells. About one to 2% are the, coming from the lining of the cells, which are called the meninges or uh, meningioma. And then we have about 19% that are uh, other type of tumors. And so if we look at more gliomas, which we also know are collectively most commonly astrocytomas or oligodendrogliomas, we know that there is a grading scheme in which the higher the grade of the tumor, the more aggressive that is. And we can see that glioblastoma multiforme, which we'll talk more about today, is the highest grade tumor. It's a grade four tumor. And the survival time, the median overall survival time is just over a year in these people. So if we think about the unique challenges to treating brain cancer, um, there are at least three things for us to think about. Number one, brain cancer is locally infiltrative, and it essentially arises from what we call permanent tissue. Permanent tissues are uh, tissues in which there is no uh, very good replicative capacity to repair. And so um, in that sense, uh, the brain tissue um, is a, a permanent tissue. And so when you have injury to the brain, you can't repair it. And so removing large sections of the brain is really a problem because you cannot repair that injury and you can't repopulate that void that is created. Um, so, so what we need to do in, in this instance is to really be very delicate, uh, uh, very delicate in trying to prevent severe injury to the brain um, and therefore, this is one of the problems uh, in, in actually treating brain cancer. You can't remove large sections of the brain and still have normal function. Uh, and so what I would say is that is a major problem uh, going on with treatment of brain cancer. Another big thing is that for glioblastoma multiforme, um, there are multiple ways that this tumor will evade uh, resistance or evade apoptosis, which is cell death. And so this type of tumor is exceptionally good at preventing or minimizing death following chemotherapy or radiation. So this is another big problem in treating a brain cancer. 
And a, a third problem is that the brain um, is actually separated uh, somewhat from your circulatory bloodstream. And this is called the blood-brain barrier. And what we know about uh, the blood-brain barrier is that if we compare uh, the, blood, the blood vessel that feeds a normal, um, a normal capillary outside of your brain, it's a relatively thin structure. It's just made up of a single layer of endothelial cells. However, if you look at the blood vessels within the brain, you can see that it's much more complex. We have not only a single endothelial layer, but you have actually support structures or podocytes that increase the thickness of the, the, the blood vessel. And this prevents drugs that are in the bloodstream to escape out into the brain. And so this is a huge problem with finding effective therapies to treat brain cancers. So if we think about uh, the standard of care right now for treating uh, glioblastoma multiforme, it, the standard of care is to surgically remove these very large infiltrative tumors, recognizing that you can't remove too much normal brain tissue because this is a permanent tissue that does not replicate, does not repair itself effectively. But you need to do surgical resection for as much tumor as you can. Then we follow these patients with radiation therapy and an oral drug, an oral chemotherapeutic drug called temozolomide. And what we know is that this standard of care, uh, essentially surgery plus radiation plus temozolomide improves the survival of, of patients from 12.1 months if they don't receive temozolomide to 14.6 months if they do receive temo temozolomide. So again, this is standard of care. What we can see is that the, unfortunately, the vast majority of people still succumb to this disease, uh, and you know the survival rate is less than 10% at five years out. So if we are thinking about the ideal drug development to deal with brain cancers, the ideal, ideal drug development is number one, can we develop a drug that overcomes apoptosis resistance? Can we make a drug that the tumor cannot evade and it's forced to die? Can we actually uh, have a drug that preferentially has activity against cancer cells and not the normal brain cells? And then can we make a drug that is blood-brain barrier penetrant, meaning that it can penetrate across into the brain tissue and fight that cancer effectively? And lastly, we recognize that most new drugs that are created are going to be used in combination, and they have to be used in combination with safety and effectiveness. So we want to develop a drug that can be combined with other therapies safely. So that's the ideal drug development path. And we essentially tackled this problem through the, a comparative oncology approach at the IGB from the pets to people uh, theme. And I'll talk really about this Procast Space 3 activating platform because this is the platform that is now in human application. So we're, we're, we've been treating human beings with cancer with this compound, and I'll tell you about that story. So uh, again, you know, this, this molecule came out from a, a brilliant chemist lab, Paul Hergen Rother, and he had a, a really ingenious strategy to say, can we develop a molecule that directly activates cell death or directly activates apoptosis. And Paul and I had an opportunity to meet and kind of made a design of, well, how could we answer this question? We worked with pets with cancer. We coordinated with uh, uh, pets with cancer through the College of Veterinary Medicine. This led to some very exciting data and we were able to establish a startup company to support the further development of this compound. We were able to uh, get enough uh, interesting data and so strong data to get support from uh, angel investors in the company, and we're able to submit a, a, a investigational new drug application to FDA, and then we are off to the races for phase one clinical trials with coordination with many uh, gifted uh, clinicians, including Dr. Dudek, who is helping us with steer many of these trials in Chicago right now. And so a little bit more about the science behind um, uh, the strategy for developing the small molecule. What we know is that if you look at uh, a cell that is going to die, you can actually have that cell die through different signaling pathways. You can do it through an intrinsic pathway which is damage to the mitochondria. 
or you can do it from an extrinsic pathway, which is usually some type of cell surface signaling. The bottom line is that most cancers have defects or breaks in these upstream pathways. And that's what cancers do. They adopt these defects so they can evade death. They don't want to die. They don't want to get killed by chemotherapy or radiation. And so they, they adopt these genetic mutations that make them more likely to survive those type of treatments. And so what Paul thought was, well, we know that this, this intrinsic pathway and this extrinsic pathway, they all funnel down to activate a molecule. And that molecule is called procaspase 3. And Paul thought, well, if cancers can block these upstream pathways, is there a way for me to create a small molecule that directly activates procaspase 3? And now it doesn't matter if cancers have these defects, we can still kill those cancers. And so that was the, the ingenuity, that was the scientific directive, and so that's what Paul did. And so Paul uh, developed and screened uh, about 21,000 small molecules for their ability uh, to actually um, kill cancer cells. And so what we see is that he developed a small molecule called PAC-1. And this is a name because it's the first procaspase 3 activating compound. Um, and this is the chemical structure of that molecule. And the way PAC-1 works is this active pharmacore right here, it essentially binds to zinc uh, cations. And so what we can see here is that binding of zinc cations, um, binding of zinc cations actually frees up procaspase 3. So procaspase 3 is tonically held um, in a relatively inactive state with zinc. And if you pull away those zinc cations, procaspase 3 becomes activated and it can do a feed forward effect and activate other downstream uh, caspases to lead to cell death. And so really the, the, the way that PAC-1 is working is that it binds to zinc. It allows procaspase 3 to have its normal a low, low constitutive activity, it then uh, feeds forward and activates more caspases that leads to cell death. And we've been able to show this at a single cell level with, with essentially genetically, uh, genetically uh, zinc sensing cells to show that PAC-1 indeed is chelating zinc. And so what we can show here is that anything, any yellow is when zinc is present and as we add PAC-1 at higher concentrations, we can make that yellow go away and it becomes more green. And that is because we're chelating the zinc away. So this is something that we did many years ago to show that the cellular mechanism is operative at a single cell level. So from these initial studies uh, that was published in Nature in 2006, uh, what Paul's group under, found out was there was an inverse relationship between procaspase 3 and sensitivity to PAC-1. And so if, if a cell has more procaspase 3, then you need lower concentrations of PAC-1 to actually cause cell death. And another important finding was that there was overexpression of procaspase 3 by malignant cells relative to normal cells. And so what he was able to show in this, uh, this seminal paper in Nature was that if you look at tumors, the higher the procaspase 3 concentration on this x-axis, the lower the concentration of PAC-1 was needed in order to kill those cells, right? So this is really important. The more procaspase a cell has, the more sensitive it becomes to PAC-1. And then, it, importantly, we were able to then look at paired samples, right? So we, we were able to collaborate with Carl Hospital in which we had cancerous colons, colon carcinoma samples removed and adjacent normal colon cells. And we could see that, again, the, the colon cancer cells were much more sensitive to PAC-1 because they had higher levels of procaspase 3 compared to the normal, normal colon cells that had very low levels of procaspase 3. You needed very, very high concentrations of PAC-1 to actually lead to death. And so this really led, allowed us to look at a preferential window in which PAC-1 could more preferentially kill cells that had more procaspase 3, which are often cancer cells. So this led to the potential opportunity to target procaspase 3 expressing cancer cells with PAC-1. And so these, these two pivotal findings 
satisfied two of the four ideal drug development criteria. One is that we developed a drug that overcomes apoptosis resistance because it directly activates procaspase 3 through chelation of labile zinc from procaspase 3, and it allowed preferential activity against cancer cells because cancer cells overexpress procaspase 3. One very important thing that we thought about during the development of PAC-1 was, although it would be wonderful to develop a, a highly effective single agent, we realized that most often drugs, new drugs, are often used in combination. And so we wanted to really develop PAC-1 with the eye on its synergistic potential, the ability to combine PAC-1 with conventional anti-cancer drugs, ionizing radiation, small molecule strategies or immunotherapeutic strategies. And the goal here was that as a single agent, we could induce cell death, but if we combined it with conventional therapeutics, we could actually have much more profound cell death. And this, the notion was that we could sensitize cancer cells with PAC-1 to become dramatically killed by conventional therapeutics. And so, what we did next was to try to satisfy the other two criteria of an ideal drug development, which is if we're fighting brain cancer, we need to have a drug that is blood-brain barrier penetrant, and we would like it to be synergizing with traditional therapies that we use against glioblastoma multiforme, specifically temozolomide. And so what we did here is we did some mouse studies in which we injected mice with PAC-1 intravenously, and then we were able to collect their blood as well as their brain tissue and we could see that actually the higher the plasma concentration of PAC-1, the higher the amount was found in the brain. And we were able to calculate the blood, brain, the, the blood to brain ratio was 70 to 30. And what that means is that 70% of the drug can be found in the blood, while 30% can be found in the brain. And this is is quite a good ratio, uh, given the fact that if we look at temozolomide, which is the drug that is used to treat uh, uh, GBM, its ratio is about 82 to 18, right? So PAC-1 is about twice the blood-brain barrier penetration capacity as te temozolomide. So we were able to show this. And then we were also able to kind of do some modeling in preparation for what we wanted to do in dogs. We looked at mice, the pharmacokinetics of PAC-1 in mice, and we look at the pharmacokinetics of PAC-1 in dogs, and we can see the areas under the curve or the exposures are equivalent. Uh, and so this helped us prime essentially the treatment of pet dogs with cancer with PAC-1, realizing that if we could get good effects in mice, we probably would get good effects in dogs. We then looked at the combination of PAC-1 with temozolomide. So what we're showing here is the cleavage of um, um, pro-caspase-3 to caspase-3. And what we can see is when we combine PAC-1 with temozolomide, we actually cleave pro-caspase-3 so we have less of it available and we have a cleavage product, which is PARP. And we were able to show through a series of different experiments that combining temozolomide with PAC-1 improved the killing capacity. So uh, what we see here is that when you combine temozolomide and PAC-1, we have about, you know, 75% of cells undergoing cell death. And we showed that the combination of temozolomide and PAC-1 was superior or synergistic in multiple cell lines. The first two, U87 and D54, are human glio glioma cell lines, and 9L is a rat glioma cell line. So what we were able to show from this data was that we fulfilled the two other criteria of ideal drug development, meaning that we found a drug that's blood-brain barrier penetrant, being PAC-1, and we could also show in vitro that PAC-1 could be combined with other therapies. So then we kind of were off to the races to really kind of figure out, does this work in mice and does it work in dogs? And so we did look at single agent activity of PAC-1 in mouse models of glioma, and what we can see here is that when we were using MRI studies of, of mice that were implanted with a mouse glioma cell line, so GL261 is a mouse glioma cell line, we see that it expresses procaspase 3 by protein as well as it expresses procaspase 3 by immunohistochemistry. When we put these tumor cells into the brain of mice and allow them to grow, we can see we can watch the growth from day 10 to day 29. This tumor is growing. And what we were able to show is that if we have mice that 
were not treated with anything, or if they were treated with PAC-1, there was a dramatic difference in the fold increase in the tumor growth over that 18-day time frame, with PAC-1 having tremendous retardation of tumor fold growth. And so this was evidence that PAC-1 in this mouse model had single agent activity to delay the growth of glioma tumors. And then we also looked in combination activity in a much more challenging mouse model in which we use human oncospheres that are intracranially implanted into, PAC, uh, implanted into mice and treated with PAC-1 and temozolomide at 50 mg per kg. And we had these different durations of treatment with PAC-1 or temozolomide. But what's important to see is that this is a survival curve and the combination of PAC-1 temozolomide, we can see that these mice live dramatically longer than TMZ alone treated mice, as well as PAC-1 treated mice versus control mice. So again, we show combination activity in these mouse models. Obviously, being a veterinarian, I wanted to show that dogs with tumors could be a valuable comparative model. And what we know is that from a comparative approach, there is a clinical need to treat dogs and people that have GBM or anaplastic meningioma. We know that there are comparative efforts in the brain cancer field right now. We know that uh, PAC-1 is blood-brain barrier penetrant. It has favorable bioavailability. We know that it can synergize with brain penetrant cytotoxins like temozolomide. We have shown, uh, we will show actually, that Procaspase 3 is overexpressed in primary brain tumors. And then uh, there, we are also going to show the feasibility to study this in a natural tumor model. And so, again, this is something that I shared in my first seminar, which is which tumor types are valued by the National Cancer Institute. And I draw your attention to brain cancer. Right, so we know that human beings get brain cancer, we know dogs get brain cancer. And so we really tried to pilot the PAC-1 scientific design with the inclusion of dogs with brain cancer. And so as animal stories are told and the science behind them, uh, this story will focus on Pretzel who had glioma and we also will talk very briefly about Haven which is a dog that had meningioma. Both dogs were treated with PAC-1 in combination with therapies. And so first of all, we wanted to show that in canine cancer cells, that procaspase 3 is expressed, as well as it's expressed in uh, tissues. And so what we have here is we look at procaspase 3 expression in classic human glioma cell lines, and then this is in red, and then we can show that in canine glioma cell lines, these three glioma cell lines, they also express procaspase 3 at Western blot in immunocytochemistry level. Very interestingly, what we have always observed is that procaspase 3 expression tends to be most intense in the highest grade tumor, which carries the worst prognosis. And we, could, we saw that in dogs. So if we look at dogs with gliomas, these are, these are gliom four dogs with gliomas. Three of these dogs had high grade gliomas. One dog had a low grade glioma. And what we can see is that procaspase 3 is highly expressed in very aggressive gliomas and not highly expressed in low-grade gliomas. The importance of this is that people and dogs with the worst tumors, high-grade tumors, will have the greatest likelihood of benefiting from a procaspase 3 activating platform. And then in addition to glioma work, we also looked at meningioma. This is another tumor type that is problematic. Uh, we can see that in dogs, they widely express procaspase 3 in tumor tissues. These are tumor meningiomas removed from dogs. 85% of canine meningiomas overexpress procaspase 3. And then we also looked at in human meningioma, we can see again, clearly procaspase 3 is tracking with grade. The higher the grade, the more aggressive the tumor is, the more procaspase is available to be targeted with PAC-1. And so we evaluated over 600 human and canine tumors, brain tumors, and we can show that uh, canine tumors, as well as human tumors, the majority overexpress procaspase 3. Um, we are able to show that, in general, the procaspase 3 staining intensity tracked with the histologic grade. So the higher the grade the tumor, the greater the staining for procaspase 3. And I think most importantly, what I would want to emphasize here is this bottom half of the slide. We know that in human 
gliomas, the prognosis is guided or dictated by histologic grade. And so what we can see here is that if you have a grade one tumor as a human being, you are pretty much cured from that tu tumor. If you have grade two or grade three tumors, you're doing pretty well, but you do begin to have uh, patients that do not survive this disease. And most importantly, grade four tumors, which are the glioblastoma multiformes, we see that there is a terrible survival curve for them. And so what we could see is that the histologic grade is strongly prognostic for survival. And then when we looked at the procaspase staining, we could show this is very similar. Again, if you had a tumor in a human being, if you have a brain tumor that's negative for procaspase three, you tend to have a better prognosis versus if you have a grade, grade one procaspase three staining tumor or grade two or three procaspase three staining tumor, we see that it tracks with prognosis. Again, patients with the gravest prognosis may derive the greatest benefit from procaspase activation. And so this is just combining them. When you look at human tumors that are procaspase negative, they, don't, they, they do do quite well. If you have any procaspase expression in your, in your brain tumor, you tend to have a worse prognosis. So this led us to actually some feasibility studies to be done in dogs with brain cancer. And the goal here was to provide high value data to inform human clinical trials with PAC-1. And we did two pivotal studies. One is uh, temozolomide with oral PAC-1 in dogs with meningioma. And we also did a radiation temozolomide oral PAC-1 in dogs with glioma. And this was a huge cooperative effort with the, the NCI involvement as well as uh, neurologists, veterinary neurologists and veterinary radiation oncologists all involved in this comparative important study. And we, we actually dipped down into our canine patient population. Again, there are certain breeds of dogs, boxers, bulldogs, Boston Terriers that are enriched for brain tumors. And so we had that patient population to actually treat with PAC-1. And so just as a, a brief summary, this is some of our canine glioma combination studies. What we could see is that the, this green highlight is really where the tumor is. And we see that after 28 days of PAC-1, single agent PAC-1 has very modest effects, maybe slight decrease in size, about 5%. But when you use PAC-1 in combination with radiation and temozolomide, you have complete, complete curing of that patient. And then this was, uh, uh, shown across at least three patients that we had really profound combination activity. So 53, 43% 40, in this patient, we had another patient that was 56%. So really, really durable, incredible responses lasting greater than two years in these animals. And so again, what we learned from this was that oral PAC-1 concurrently with temozolomide and definitive radiation therapy is not only safe, but it is actually active and exerts good good anti-cancer effects. And so the summary is that for the gliomas, we had one uh, complete response, two partial responses. And for the meningioma studies, we had one dog with a partial response and two, two dogs that had very long-standing stable diseases. And so, you know, with that uh, animal studies, we were able to draw some strong conclusions. One is that PAC-1 can directly activate procaspase 3 and that's through sequestration of these inhibitory zinc ions. PAC-1 readily penetrates the blood-brain barrier and has potential for central nervous system cancers. PAC-1 is orally available and can be given at doses that activate procaspase in vivo. And we can show that PAC-1 can synergize with a wide variety of standard of care cancer drugs in various cancer models. And so the use of pet dogs with cancer were critical to realize toxicity, as well as limited single agent activity. It was necessary to develop tolerable dosing regimens to inform human clinical trials, and it really provided preliminary evidence for combination studies to, to move to people. And so really where the human applications come in now is that there, there, there was a series of clinical trials of PAC-1 in human cancer patients, and this is through uh, support of the startup company Vanquish Oncology, and over 70 human cancer patients to date have been treated with PAC-1, usually once a day for 21 days in a seven-day break, and then a repeat of a cycle. And so what we know is that there, these, there are two completed phase one trials of PAC-1. One is a component one in which these are late-stage cancer patients that were recruited to receive oral PAC-1, 
And then we had a component two, which were specifically in human cancer patients that had recurrent glioblastoma multiforme. So they had been treated and then they ultimately had their tumors regrow. And so these two components have been completed. And so what I'll say is that for phase one, component one in late stage cancers, there were 48 patients that were enrolled across seven dose levels. Um, of these seven dose levels, we can see that the pharmacokinetics of PAC-1 was exceptionally predictable and very, very good. Uh, these patients maintained very high uh, trough levels or trough concentrations, meaning the lowest level in their blood was actually quite, quite high. It was about five micromolar concentration. And we know that from all of our in vitro studies, five micromolar of PAC-1 exposure is very, very effective in synergizing with all forms of therapy, radiation, chemo, small molecule, as well as we're developing immunotherapeutic data too. And so it was really, really promising to see the pharmacokinetics of PAC-1 were so well, well, well um, demonstrated in cancer patients. Uh, and what we showed in this component one study was that there were some patients that had prolonged stable disease over 12 months in some patients. So they, their disease stopped growing and they were held in, in stable disease for over 12 months. And really interestingly, there was a subpopulation of, of people that um, had neuroendocrine tumors that there was a provocative signal that they, they were some responses in people that were treated with single agent PAC-1. And so this is just an example of a neuroendocrine tumor uh, in, in these patients, what we can see here is that this is a neoplastic population clearly staining for Procaspase 3, and we can see the surrounding non-neoplastic stroma is completely devoid of Procaspase 3. So again, showing preferential overexpression of the target of PAC-1 within just the tumor cells. And then so in phase one, component two of recurrent glioblastoma, what we can say is that we have at least 18 patients enrolled with relapsing GBM. Five of these patients achieved either stable disease or partial responses. And I think this is quite remarkable because these are patients that are re relapsing GBMs. We know that GBM grows very, very quickly. And so the achievement of stable disease is quite good. The achievement of a partial response is really, really excellent. And so what we know is that um, these patients did demonstrate some activity when they're treated with PAC-1 with temozolomide. And so this is an example of uh, a patient before treatment where you do have a small regrowing GBM. And then after PAC-1 temozolomide, we see that this, this mass has shrunken down. And then this is very uh, interesting because it parallels what we found in dogs treated with meningioma with PAC-1 temozolomide. So this is a dog with a meningioma involving the, the, the occipital lobe. And we can see that after we treat with temozolomide PAC-1, we also get some uh, dramatic shrinkage in that primary tumor. All these findings have led to FDA orphan drug designation of PAC-1 for GBM. And so where are we now you know, for our human applications? Well, there are expanded clinical trials now. Uh, we're going uh, building off of our phase 1B or phase 2 trials. There is an ongoing clinical trial with PAC-1 in combination with a multi-kinase inhibitor. And this is used for metastatic uveal melanoma. Uh, and this is actively recruiting patients right now. This is an example of a human being with a uveal melanoma that has begun to invade into the white part of your eye, which is known as a sclera. Localized disease is not a problem, but what we know from uveal melanoma is about 90% of uveal melanomas will spread very quickly to the liver. And this is a, a CT scan of a human being. And this is the liver. And you see all these light gray areas are metastatic lesions riddling the, the patient's liver. We are uh, in, in planning uh, to move to a phase two trial of PAC-1 as a single agent in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. This is really built off of our phase one trial that we saw some provocative activity. This is just, again, a CT scan of a human cancer patient with a nodule or a mass involving the pancreas. It's a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. And then we are also planning on moving to a phase two clinical trial for recurrent glioblastoma, in which usually we have an initial glioblastoma, but we know that these tumors are very difficult to remove, and then you can have regrowth. And so this is another phase two trial that is in planning right now. 
So overall, you know, I think that this hopefully highlights the success of human applications of novel therapeutics that have come out from the University of Illinois. And so this has gone through this paradigm of discovery, right? We, we identify novel targets, we find novel compounds, and we, have, and we are able then to move the best compounds into pet dogs with comparative tumors and then learn from our pet dogs to guide new treatment options or better treatment protocols for people with similar diseases. And so what I would say is that to end with, again, we have pets that uh, we love and we care for deeply with that unfortunately develop cancer. Uh, these pets that develop cancer have uh, clear overlapping tumors that are shared between humans and dogs. And then again, through the compassionate care through the College of Veterinary Medicine, we can actually help treat pets with cancer. We can actually leverage the, the, the powerful chemistry department at the University of Illinois with the, the, the robust new molecules that are coming out to fight cancer. We, 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 are, we are really guided by the infra infrastructure and leadership from the IGB, specifically the anti-cancer discovery from pets to people theme as well as the Cancer Center at Illinois that has the vision to include um, comparative tumor models as a very important pillar in the, the scientific program of their center. I'd be happy to take questions. Dr. Fan, thank you so very much. As you presented your last slide, I was struck at how incredible it is to live in a time where all of these silos, I came up through academics at the time when we were all working within our silos and to be outside of the silos or connecting them to great benefit such as cancer research is remarkable. Um, we do have a number of questions and I think the question that I'll start with is um, to what extent does research on cancer and viruses overlap? So repeat that question one more time. I'm sorry. To what extent does the cancer or do cancers between, do cancers and viruses overlap? I would imagine their cellular behavior. I see. I see. Um, so, so I think, well, so I think that one thing is that there is uh, there are about 15 to 20 percent of cancers that are caused by viruses, um, but I think that you know the virus is is required to to have a host cell right to to facilitate its replication, while a cancer cell is a eukaryotic cell that's completely completely independent, right? So it can grow independent of any type of help. Uh, I'm not sure if I if I understand or answer the question though. No, I think you did. I think that we do have some similarities, but there is an extent to which they stop. Um, I think that's fair. Um, here's a question that might be a little meatier, and it is, although there is a strong correlation, can there be risk in trying the same treatment just because it worked for animals? And I would imagine that's trying the same treatment with humans as you have with animals. Um, I think that, you know, so what, what I would say is that um, animal models, re regardless of their sophistication, um, are, are models, right? So we, we have to recognize that there are always going to be limitations, right? So something that works in a mouse model uh, does not necessarily work in a human cancer patient. Something that works in dogs with naturally occurring tumors do not necessarily, will not necessarily mean it will work in people either. And, and what I would, what I would want to say is that um, I'll draw an example. So when we look at human clinical trials, right? So the human being is a model for a human being, right? So in human clinical trials, we have phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials. In phase one clinical trials, hits or interesting responses noted in phase one clinical trials, only about three out of eight hits actually are replicated in phase three clinical trials. And so what that means is that the human being itself is not a perfectly predictive model, right? So exciting results that you see even in phase one clinical trial are never replicated or are not borne out to be statistically significant in these larger phase three clinical trials. And so 
what I would say is that any model system is is always a tool or something to help bolster or support your hypothesis, recognizing that even in people, there's heterogeneity in response. And so even in, in a human model, humans don't model themselves perfectly either. Of course we don't. That should not surprise any of us. Um, but I think you speak to something that's really important and that is being able to understand modeling or how we apply modeling and if we are doing our job in our um, classrooms and i know that's always a challenge modeling is part of the next generation science standards so um, hopefully we'll be able to put that to use um, in other applications one of the questions and i'm not sure if this is a quickie or not what are human oncosphere cells? And I'm probably saying that wrong. Oncosphere? Uh, yes, yes. Human oncosphere. So um, what what we what we have here is that we have human cancer cells that are that are grown grown in a special way that enriches for um, aggressive behaviors. It, it, essentially, it enriches for what we call a stem stem cell phenotype. So cancer stem cells are thought to be the cells that are responsible for drug resistance. They're thought to be responsible, involved in metastasis. They're thought to be responsible for recurrence. And so when we have um, human cancer cells grown in oncospheres, essentially we're implanting the most aggressive population of human cancer cells into those mice to replicate the most aggressive forms of disease because we're enriching for um, the genotype and the phenotype of aggression. Okay, I see. Oh, I did not realize that um, that particular type of cell had its own um, identification or name. So thank you for that. Um, here's a question. Do the new drugs have negative side effects like with many other cancer treatments? And I imagine there's a trade-off, but what are some of the side effects? Yeah, so I think that uh, every drug, in my opinion, has a side effect. Um, specifically for PAC-1, uh, what, what we see is that it does get across a blood-brain barrier, right? And that was the, the, the thing that we are striving for. And at high doses in the, the human clinical trials, um, people would comment that there would be a brief period of uh, euphoria and or um, a change in perception, right? So a uh, mild euphoria, it could be transient, like hallucination, like it, clearly there was something getting into the brain of these human cancer patients. Uh, many of them commented that they, they did not think that the sensation was unpleasant. They, they almost commented that it gave them a, a period of euphoria. Very importantly for th this first clinical trial with PAC-1, we were very, very aware of the need to ensure that there was no neurocognitive problems being induced by PAC-1. And so there, these uh, cancer patients went through a battery of neurocognitive assessments throughout the course of receiving PAC-1, and their neurocognitive assessments did not change throughout the course of receiving PAC-1. So we felt very strongly that although PAC-1 was penetrating into the blood-brain barrier, and some patients would comment on this kind of out of body or euphoric or hallucinatory type of events, um, their neurocognitive skills maintained stable throughout the entire course of therapy. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I suppose if we're struggling with cancer, a side effect that brings a little bit of a pleasant feeling is not so bad. So thank you for answering that question. Um, here's another nice juicy question. As the comparative oncology approach to treatment becomes more popular, do you think there's a chance that there might be moral and ethical violations for the sake of research and money? So um, I, what I would say, that's a, good, that's a great question. That's always something that comes up, right? Um, what I would say is the clinical trials that that we conduct, and I would say that probably every veterinary oncologist that's doing comparative research likely abides by, is these clinical trials are completely voluntary, right? So the owners have, the pet owners have um, every right at any time to withdraw their pet from the clinical trial, like no questions asked. And so there is, there is in my mind, uh, there is no, um, 
concern for you're forcing me to do this, right? So obviously the dog or cat is not able to opt in or out, right? Because it's, it's really the pet owner that's making that decision. But what I would say is that from a pet owner's perspective, whenever they enroll their pet into a clinical trial, it is completely voluntary and they could withdraw their pet for any reason. No questions asked from that clinical trial. That's not a problem. So I don't, I don't feel that there is an ethical or moral um, uh, dilemma here. I do think that uh, pet owners have to be well educated on all standard of care. They have to be educated on the biology of disease. They have to be provided with full transparency. What are the risks? What are the benefits? What are the potential problems? And as long as we are uh, operating above board, then I think that there there should be no perceived or uh, real uh, moral dilemma there. Okay, thank you for that. And, and hence, that's why we go through so many trials. And I appreciate you pointing out that everyone that does participate is a volunteer or giving consent. Um, Dr. Fan, do you think organ on chips show promise for preclinical pre testing in oncology? I hope that makes sense to you. Organ yeah. on chips. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would say that I'm not at all an expert on 3D model systems. I do know that uh, certainly these are great, um, great ways to increase throughput. Um, and certainly at the University of Illinois with a very strong engineering background, there, there's a lot of uh, fabrication expertise, engineering expertise to really replicate many, many different types of uh, cellular scenarios such as organs on a chip's inclusion of microfluidic devices. And so I do think clearly uh, 3D models with the ability of their, tune, you can tune them, meaning that you can change the microenvironmental parameters um, is a great way to get get a lot of information quickly, and I have no doubt that they will they will continue to be more and more used in drug development path. Thank you, thank you for touching on that, and I think this question would be a nice one to end on. Um, we talked briefly about it before the program. How many hours do you work a week on average, and do you work more now than when you were in college? Yeah, so I, I think that um, I think it it's what we define as work, right? And so I spend probably 55, 60 hours um, with doing stuff uh, related to my work. And much of that is, is at the office, but some of it is at home as well. Um, but and so in comparison to in college, I, I think that college – yeah, you had to study, right? Because you were motivated to hopefully do well on your exam and learn the material. But many times that was an onus, right? That was a chore. Oh, I have to do this, right? In order for me to, you know, have a good grade point average or better my position for a graduate career or whatnot. And so um, that work as a college student, I thought was was onerous, right? You you have to do it. it may, you may not love doing it, but you have to do it. And so. I reflect back now, I'm, I'm much busier and much more of my time is consumed with what I do today. But I don't look at it necessarily as work. I look at it as something that I really, really enjoy. It's something that I find fulfillment and professional and per personal satisfaction from. And so I don't, I, quite honestly, I don't get up in the morning and say, oh gosh, I have to go to work. I, I don't. And, and I, I get up and I'm like, okay, let's go. And I, I like the routine. I like the challenge. I like the personal fulfillment. And the 55, 60 hours that I put into it on a weekly basis, I don't look at it as work. Uh, sometimes my wife would contend that I should look at it as work. Um, but, but I really enjoy what I do. And I have fun with doing it. I feel fulfilled doing it. And so it's not at all a burden in my opinion. It's a it's a privilege in my opinion. Oh, wonderful. And I imagine that's because you view your work as service to others. And um, we're all 
much better for it. So thank you so much, Dr. Fan. We are so grateful for your time, not only this evening, but throughout the entire series, your expertise, your enthusiasm, and even the clarity to discuss some very complicated topics. So greatly appreciated. If you would like to see the first two programs, we started with comparative anatomy and then talked about animal stories. You can rewatch or reshare this program by going to C2STTV on YouTube. You can also evaluate tonight's program and give us feedback for future programs by going to C2ST2.CNF.io where you were asking questions. And if you're looking to support STEM literacy this spring, you can donate at c2st.org. You can also sign up for our weekly newsletter and stay up to date on what we're doing in STEM. And then finally, hey, this is Dawn from C2ST. And we're so grateful that you stuck around to the end of the video. And we hope that you were able to learn something new. Now, here comes the really important part. If you enjoyed what you watched, please like this video and subscribe to our channel. And if you really, really liked what you saw, you can hit the bell icon and get notified every time we upload a new video. And if you're really moved, captivated, just want to give us your thoughts, leave a comment below. Thank you very much for watching and stay safe.